Uh, I, wait a minute. Hang on. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I knew I was in trouble. Uh, and it's just the simplest thing. I trying to adjust the position of my mouse here on the table so I can like move things all around and stuff. And so I move it from say 10 o'clock to about 1130. If you're, if you're looking at it, like, so 10 o'clock to about 1130 and have it here in front of me. And so it's like, all right, what am I doing? Can I, you know, can I swing this? Can I swing, you know? And so of course I forget to, uh, make sure that for those of you watching on the video side of things that I didn't click off of that in time. And so that's why you saw that off the top instead of me. Hi, Thursday thoughts here at soccer down here. Soccer's morning show, John, hear you there. And there's a couple of things to, to get into this morning. Obviously we'll start with stupidity down here because we've been promoting it this morning, a couple of different rounds of stupidity. Then we have a lot of stuff. We have news yesterday, uh, that we're catching up on out of the Premier League with the results there. Uh, Manchester United, uh, Manchester City takes it on the chin again, and uh, you get to see what Unai Emery is able to do at Aston Villa. And so we got that. We've got stuff at the bottom of the table as well with the results there. We've got, uh, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, stuff with LAFC and their fans. You've got... Let's see, stuff with the Lionesses and Pochettino and relegations and all this kind of stuff. Nico Moreno joining us at 1030, as he always does. And we'll go over uh, anything and everything in Nico's mind as we get ready for MLS Cup coming up this weekend. We'll go backward, talk about the semis, talk about Seattle, talk about their uh, contract situation. Stefan Fry uh, signed the deal yesterday. There's also been some uh, movement in and around the league with players. We'll get into that as well. And uh, that'll once again lead to, to Nico at 1030 and get you into all of the other stuff that's going on today. We'll let you know what to watch, where to watch it, and all the gossip, rumor, and innuendo uh, as well. So that is, that's the rundown for the morning. Uh, quick reminder, I don't know if you saw it yesterday on the 280 character app, but we did post that the uh, Atlanta is American soccer scarf with the Vic Crow quote from 1968. It's up and running. We'll repost it again in case you missed it. But once again, 25 plus five, unless the Abstermobile is going to take care of shipping for you. Once again, we're reissuing the scarf for the holidays as part of a two-step process to help out our friends at the Marshall Islands because they want to do some stuff here domestically in 2024. And so we're trying to help them out here on this side of the planet come uh, next year. So that's step one of a process, step two coming up in short order. And so that is, that's a uh, round one reminder. Round two reminder is uh, programming tomorrow is going to be a little backward because of the high school football championships. I have to be at Mercedes Benz during this particular time slot. So we'll release prim and proper on tape in the morning. And then we'll have an SDH in the afternoon to get you ready for the weekend. So uh, our friends at Beyond Goals will get uh, we'll get another Friday off, and so we'll we'll uh, take care of all of that. But we'll get you ready for the weekend. So prem and proper in the morning, SDH PM will get you ready for the weekend. We'll talk about news of the day. Stuff should have calmed down in uh, Europe uh, with matchups and things like that. And so we'll talk about that coming up, obviously tomorrow but remember so prem and proper early sdh in the afternoon tomorrow so maddie and drew will get their venting out of the way and we will have prem and proper as your morning release and get you ready for the weekend with an sdh pm all right uh all right so it's that time opening kickoff once again brought to us by our friends at kickoff coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com there's your qr code for those of you who are uh, on the video portion watching the program, whether it's on our YouTube channel, on the Twitch pitch, or on the 280 character app, don't forget to use the code Soccer Down Here 15. They in turn take uh, they, they'll take 15% uh, off your purchase, and in turn take 10% reinvested into the youth game, youth initiatives. Very very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and KickoffCoffeeCO.com. You've probably seen the quote. Joey Barton's being a Neanderthal. And we'll go over what Joey said, and we will refute it fairly quickly, but unfortunately it is not the only part of stupidity down here this morning. Uh, yesterday, 
on on Twitter at Joey Seven Barton at Joey Seven Barton on the Twitters. So uh, he says, and he decided to uh, add to it this morning. Yesterday, and I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to find the particular quote because he has been uh, he's been lit up as he should have been yesterday uh, about the whole thing. Uh, and it's been a it, it's been a series a series of things, and so of course uh, Barton, who is you know is the kind of guy that wants to sit there. And uh, talk about uh, the the women's. It, it talks about all right. So literally, uh, fifteen hours ago. So that would be so what? Fifteen hours ago, our time would be midnight. So like when he woke up this when he woke up yesterday morning or something like that, or add five hours or whatever. Joey Barton said this. Women shouldn't be talking with any kind of authority in the men's game. Come on, let's be serious. It's a completely different game. If you don't accept that, we will always see things differently. The women's game is thriving. Fantastic to see. I cannot take a thing they say serious in the men's arena. Hashtag namaste. And we'll go through the timeline and expose him for being the the thinker that he is. Traditionally, you can't let this stuff get to you. And Ricky, we will be talking about Villa. You can't let this stuff get to you, no matter how out of touch individuals are. But when you have on the 280 character app over 2 million followers, something has to be said. And for Joey Barton to completely and discount individuals who are very, very good at their job, who happen to be discussing a sport that they played and can talk about it either on radio or television or both or on this show, we got to stand up and say something. And I thought about it yesterday when when this when this came out. Do we address it? And when you have someone who has a megaphone to over two million people, the answer is yes. So this will be somewhat in a letter to Joey, but it will be more in a generic sense as well. We all know individuals here on this side of the Atlantic that are very, very good at what they do. One of them in particular lives here, has been on this show, is a part of the SDH family, and works in Charlotte, and works on Sirius XMFC, and has done stuff overseas. But apparently, if Joey Barton was to have his way, Someone like Jessica Charman would have no business talking about the men's game. That kind of behavior, that kind of thought pattern has to stop. I can guarantee you that as a part of the 2.3 million followers on the 280 character app, there are a lot of them, I'm fairly certain, that share his opinion. It is out of debt. It is out of date. It is out of touch. It is Neanderthal. And it holds the game back on the whole. There are tremendously talented people who talk about this sport. What it says on the driver's license should not matter. They've played the game, they understand the game. They're authority figures for a reason. And rightfully so, Joey Barton has been gunned on social media about it. 
He absolutely should be gunned on this. He hasn't changed his opinion, mind you. He continued, any man who listens to women commentary or co-coms need their heads testing. Hashtag stick to your own game. Fine, I'll get my head tested. Some of the most intelligent folks who discuss the game today happen to be women who cross over and talk about the men's game. When you have stuff like this, you have to combat it. You legitimately do. Stand by everything I've said on women commenting and co-coms on the men's football. Like me, talking about knitting or netball. Way out of my comfort zone. Some of the men are bad enough. We've gone too far. You cannot watch a game now without hearing the nonsense. Any man who says otherwise is an absolute fart parcel. Fine. I'm an absolute fart parcel. I give Joey credit for his expansion of my of my language. I didn't know that farts came in parcels. Legitimately, I didn't. Maybe they come in various sizes of parcel. I don't know. I will gladly take and put on my resume that I'm an absolute fart parcel. Then listen to you the next time that you are on COCOMS. Because you're not managing anymore. And a network picks you up. What credence should I give you, comma, Joey Barton, comma? Because you've been fired from gigs. You shouldn't be able to talk about managers then. Because you've been employed as them but no longer have been at times. Every single time you get hired for a gig and then you get dismissed, that to me means, if we take this logic train and move it forward, that you talking about other managers makes you an absolute fart parcel, once again, by by your thought pattern. You talking about other managers puts you in the fart parcel, uh, puts you in the fart parcel bin with the rest of us. If I like listening to informed opinions and they happen to be women talking about the men's game, then why should I listen to you if you were an unemployed manager when you want to criticize other managers? And and like I said, and this was this morning, absolutely this morning. So Joey was fired up, you know, 10 o'clock this morning. The women's game is absolutely thriving. Great to see. It's a fantastic sport in its own right. See, then this is where he sets up the qualifiers. Every single time he's done something like this and has had to go full 280 characters or go for a couple of pages, he'll set up a qualifier. Really entertaining, good to watch. Technically and tactically, not that much difference. Physically, complete different planet. Until you've experienced that, you cannot say what you would have done in said position at no time, no. It's got a great England team that wins stuff. It's got its own Premier League. It's got its own Champions League. Please, for the love of God, go and commentate on that. You can say what you want. You'll be qualified to. You have actual experience of what is taking place. The Unix might not agree, but somebody had to say something. Hate it having to be me. Actually, dude, I don't think you do. I don't think you do. And then he goes off on some tangent about what other folks say. So. That's Joey Barton for you this morning. I probably spent a lot more, t- a lot more time. Is that? I probably spent too much time. I probably spent too much time. On what he does and what he said. 
And he continues, and it's just not worth my time. But in a situation like this, when you have someone who has over 2 million characters, I think we got to say something. Legitimately. Because if you let this kind of behavior go unfettered, then people think that it's either accepted, acceptable, or okay to say things like that if you have no basis in fact and just want to vent or what have you. But for Joey Barton to say what he said, it's ill-informed, it's antiquated, it's out of touch, and needs to be stopped. That's stage one of opening kickoff, brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. There is more stupidity. We'll get into it in a second. But I feel like I had to take a break here. That's your QR code for those of you watching on the 280-character app, on Twitch, and on the uh, YouTube channel here for Soccer Down Here. Use the code Soccer Down Here 15. They take 15% off of your purchase. They, in turn, take 10% reinvested into the youth game and youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. Joy Barton's out of touch. Needs to be stopped. Anyone who thinks like that needs to be stopped. Because if we don't talk about it, once again, it it comes across as accepted behavior, which it's not. You don't like to sit here and and give anything like that credence, give it the time of day. But in a situation like that, when we know better, when we know better on this show, when we know better here on this network, when we have folks who know the game backward and forward, For Joey Barton to say trash like that, and that's what it is. It's 280 character trash. And to continue to draw traffic to his own particular profile, then it's got to be addressed. So, Joey Barton, yeah, you're, you're out of touch. Not a surprise that you're out of touch, but you're out of touch. And so, uh, you know, everybody who's in this morning, and Tom, we're glad that you're on the, the road to recovery, by the way. Uh, Hutch, last time I heard a statement like that was from one of my rugby teammates commenting about women's rugby. They should stay at home and prepare the cheese and tomato sandwiches. And that was in the late 70s. David, does this mean men can't comment on the women's game? If so, I might take that to get Alexi and Taylor off the WNT coverage. It may, David, it may. Joey Barton wouldn't want to, I think, first and foremost. And so I think that's part of the part of the shtick. And yes, at the end of the day, this fellow is just a no-talent ass clown. I would tend to agree. Circle gets the square. Tom. And are the games really that different? The athletes may be different, but is the game really that different? You're telling me it's impossible for a woman to discuss a double pivot because she may not be as fast and strong as a male player? It's just dumb. Yes, it is. Absolutely it is. But once again, Joey Barton has never been... Never been one to shy away from a public opinion, antiquated or not. And so that's where we are with Joey Barton. Uh, The other piece of stupidity down here comes from uh, our old buddy, Luis Rubiales. And it's come across in a couple of uh, different different, uh, publications. Paul McInnes at uh, The Guardian, Lawrence, Lawrence Ostler at The Independent. Apparently, you know, we, we were talking about Luis Rubiales and Jenny Hermoso and how much trouble that that got uh, Rubiales into despite his denials and repeated denials and all that kind of stuff. According to Paul McInnes at The Guardian et al., Rubiales kissed Lucy Bronze seemingly forcefully and cupped the face of her England teammate Laura Coombs after the Women's World Cup final in August, according to the chair of the FA. Claims were made in a submission by Debbie Hewitt to a FIFA disciplinary committee investigating Rubiales' behavior after the World Cup. In response, Rubiales accused Hewitt of, quote, absolutely disgusting behavior and suggesting he is some form of creep. 
The committee ultimately suspended Drew Bialis, you'll remember, from football activity for three years. Claims emerged after the committee published the written reasons for banning Rubiales. Former president of the Spanish Fed became the object of it, the of international opprobrium. That man, that's a word to use. You know that's coming from overseas when they use the word opprobrium. Seen celebrating, and we got into the Jenny Hermosa bit. Hewitt and the president of New Zealand football, Joanna Wood, wrote submissions to the disciplinary committee after they'd witnessed Rubiales' behavior and wanted to give, quote, first-hand observations on impact, end quote. Hewitt describes a series of inappropriate actions involving Ruby Alice and substantiates Hermosa, Hermosa's vis, a version of events in what the committee describes as, quote, the kiss incident, end quote. Hewitt writes, Hermosa was not the only person subject to inappropriate in- attentions. According to the committee's account of her submission, Hewitt observed Ruby Alice behavior while standing next to him in the metal presentation line. We'll have to go back and get the video on this. He shook the hand of every England player, touched a few on the arm as they walked past, but then cupped and stroked, in quotation marks, the face of the player, Laura Coombs, which Hewitt thought was slightly odd, and then he seemingly forcefully kissed the English player, Lucy Bronze, on her face. In his response to the submission, Ruby Alice said it was, quote, astonishing to read the amount of prejudice that Ms. Hewitt showed. Claimed Hewitt had hugged several players even after clearly noticing that they were extending their hands to receive a handshake. The hypocrisy is blatant, Rubiales said, adding the way she presents a gentle gesture of comfort to all the rivals, suggesting that he is some sort of creep is absolutely disgusting. Rubiales said he had stroked Coombs' face in an an attempt to comfort her, as, quote, Ms. Coombs was injured during the final, had to receive stitches, and was wearing a bandage in her head, end quote. Unused to sub in the final, Rubiales also accused Hewitt of blatantly lying in her account of the kiss involving Hermoso. We'll get into the LAFC stuff next. I know that you guys are talking about it. We'll get into it. 35-page document published by the disciplinary committee paints a picture of events in the final, the aftermath, and Rubiales' behavior throughout. Committee notes... That Rubiales is yet to apologize to Hermoso, continues to insist that the player had given consent, even though, quote, the kiss could not be seen as having been consensual from the perspective of a reasonable and objective observer, end quote. So Luis Rubiales continues to sit there and once again, we talk about that being out of date, out of touch, being a Neanderthal. There you go. Uh, LAFC, I know that you guys were, were uh, getting that discussed in the timeline, and that came out yesterday. Uh, no recovery necessary, Tom. Literally on the way to the orthopedic doctor right now to discuss results of the MRI. I'm sure I'm going to be told I need surgery, but maybe not. Fingers crossed. Yes. Ruby Alice, Ricky. If he thinks that's okay, I'm sure there's not as well. Uh, Joey Barton, I think. Uh, if he thinks that's okay, I'm sure there's more things he thinks women shouldn't do, and then we've gone down the slippery slope 50 to 100 years backwards. Yes, true. Now, uh, you guys wanted to get into LAFC. And Kevin Baxter over at the LA Times got into this yesterday. And apparently, 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 Kevin Baxter came out with an article. Major League Soccer has fined LAFC and suspended the supporters group 3250 due to, due to misconduct allegations. Say that 10 times fast. Suspends supporters group 3252 due to misconduct allegations. And once again, once again, when you have more than one writer on a story, you know what's going on. LAFC has been fined $100,000, and 3252 s privileges have been suspended pending an investigation by Major League Soccer due to allegations of serious misconduct. That was announced last night. So you, you end up with that news. They also There has been a probe into the supporters' union including, and for it's a serious, okay, so here it is. MLS finds LAFC 100 grand, launched a probe into the 3252 for serious misconduct, including the lighting of flares prior to the match against Houston December 2nd, 
The 3252 will have all supporter privileges suspended pending completion of the probe. And there's a picture of uh, Chiellini as their headliner. That he is basically walking into all of that smoke and fire and flame and all of that stuff. You barely could see Giorgio Chiellini. And if you remember what went down with uh, the beginning of the match and you could barely see what was going on, barely could see it. Supporter groups set off flares not authorized by Major League Soccer during the Western Conference Final, creating so much smoke it delayed the match. 3252. Supporter privileges for attending MLS Cup will be restricted. Fans could face other sanctions next season after the league completes the investigation. Quote, this is from Major League Soccer. In coordination with Major League Soccer, LAFC agrees to conduct a full investigation of the incident. Violators will be subject to further penalties, indefinite bans, including MLS Cup, and all appropriate legal action. The comprehensive review will focus on improving security and supporter management processes for 2024 and beyond. You might remember uh, Ileana Limon. She's now Ileana Limon Romero from uh, the Orlando Sentinel. She is now out with the LA Times and wrote that piece with Kevin Baxter. So basically what's going on here is that LAFC, I want to know, and this is something that, this is something, and like I said, I'm really incredibly, I'm really incredibly naive, and I'm, you know, I'm an old FUD, so, I mean, for me, it's trying to figure out how things happen. How do you smuggle flares, how do you smuggle flares into a match? How do you smuggle flares into a stadium? I mean, legitimately, that's that, that's something that that is something that I would try to figure. It's like, how do you do this? How do you do this? How would you smuggle that stuff into the stadium? And I mean, those of you who are probably far more uh, advanced in, in these kinds of things, as I, you know, you're far far better at that than I am. How do you smuggle flares inside a stadium? And then try to figure out how to light them and all that kind of stuff. And then, I mean, and you would, and I, I know that folks don't sit there and they go, okay, well, it's a little, it's a little thick out here right now, kind of overcast, you know, marine layers in, a little foggy, a little wet. That when you were lighting those flares, you might have the smoke that you had that would just sit there for a while. But yeah. <laughs> Kepsi. Kepsi is a professional hoodlum. I have no idea. Kepsi admits to being a professional hoodlum. But yeah, and, and I know that you you're more focused on lighting the flare and having the spectacle as opposed to looking at the weather conditions and going, you know, maybe I shouldn't light this because the smoke will just hover. And that's what happened. 3252 lights all these flares. The smoke hangs over BMO. They have to delay the start of the match because of it. They have to let the smoke dissipate. And now the 3252 have had their uh their activity is suspended. LAFC has been fined six figures. And now they've got to figure out how to how to investigate this. How do we investigate this? Supporter privileges for the 3252 are restricted, facing other sanctions next season. I'm I don't see, and once again, we get into this. And Kepsi says, practically, speak, practically speaking, they'd have plenty of places to put things, but security wouldn't detect it with machines and they'd have to pat down, I guess. I mean, that sounds about right. But how do you, in a situation like this, enforce someone being from the 3252? 
legitimately. How do you do that? You sit there and it's like, okay, I need your ID. And instead of giving your driver, your California driver's license, you actually give your 3252 card. Is it a picture ID? How, how do you plan on enforcement? Is LAFC going to go to 3252 and sit there and say, we need a member list and we'll cross-reference it with our, our season ticket holders? Ask for uh, picture IDs when you go walking in the door? How do you plan on restricting what they do? No noisemakers to the bass drums and all of the all of the noisemakers that they bring in, are they not allowed in next season? How are you going to enforce this in Columbus? Like I said, I'm just I'm asking these open-ended questions because I have no idea. I have no idea how you enforce this. I mean, seriously, if somebody's a fan of LAFC, they could just go in wearing whatever they want. They could wear a you know a polo and a pair of jeans for temps in the 60s with a rain jacket. Maybe have an LAFC coat on. And until and unless you have an ID card that's or a t-shirt that says I'm 3252 and proud of it. Then you go walking in the door at lower.com in downtown Columbus, Ohio, and someone in security is going to sit there and say, oh, you're wearing a 3252 shirt. Your your, uh, activities are restricted. I mean, seriously, how are you going to enforce this, A, this weekend, and B, the beginning of next year? And LAFC has been fined, and they're supposed to have an investigation into this. Okay, who of you brought the flares? Literally, this is like being when we were in elementary school. You have the the assembly, and the principal is sitting there, and he's wagging his finger at all of you, going, okay, which one of you did this? I need all of you to stand on this line. And the person who did this, step forward. Everybody takes a half step back, except for one guy who's not thinking fast enough. Ah, so you did it, but no. And then you look behind you, and you see everybody else is taking a half step back. Seriously, how do you enforce this? I'd love to know. Like I said, I'd love to know how you're going to enforce this on short notice. You are two days away from MLS Cup. The supporters can go in plain clothes. I mean, they could wear Cincinnati gear. Or they could wear whomever. Or they could wear LA Aztec stuff. They could wear LA, well, no, they wouldn't wear LAG stuff. They could wear LA Aztec stuff. They could wear California surf stuff. They could wear crew stuff if they wanted and then take it off the second they get in the building. How are they going to enforce the restrictions for 3252? Here's my membership card. I mean, seriously, how are you going to enforce this on two days' notice and separate the 3252 away from LAFC fans and away from Columbus fans? And then this investigation that you're that you're planning. I mean, obviously the 3252 will step up and sit there and say, "Okay, yeah, we're sorry. We didn't realize the repercussions of having a uh, having a flare in Marine Layer. We didn't understand the meteorological effect, and it was going to hover over the stadium. We figured it was going to be a cool visual. It was going to pop up into the air, and we'd be done with it." You need Dallas Reigns or Brianna Ruffalo. Or, I was about to say Dr. George, but, you know, uh, dear rest Dr. George. But, yeah, you need Dallas Reigns or Brianna Ruffalo to sit there and tell you whether or not you should be able to do that kind of stuff. By the way, there are two meteorologists for the ABC affiliate in Los Angeles. Have them there sit there and say, nope, you don't want to do that. Or do it as a weather report leading into a match. For those of you who are the 3252, and if you're planning on anything flares, don't do it because it'll hover over the stadium. You get that kind of meteorological impact. <sighs> like I said, I don't know how Major League Soccer is going to reinforce this uh, or, or just enforce it from a perspective of legality. 
Everybody walk in the door in Columbus. Here's my driver's license. Here's my 3252 membership card. You go walking up. Uh, can I see your ID, please? Show your driver's license. Are you a member of 3252? Nope. Okay, come on in. I'd love to know how they plan on enforcing this. I really would. That's just me. Okay. Uh, so that happened yesterday in uh, in Major League Soccer. Uh, other news in MLS since we're here. You've had some signings and some folks who are, you know, are they're kind of wandering around and uh, figuring out what's going on. Big news out of Orlando City yesterday. Orlando City and club captain Mauricio Pereira have agreed on a mutual contract termination. Don't know the why. Pereira says, Pereira says, quote, I'll miss you. I wish nothing but the best for you. I love you. And thank you, Luis Muzi. Mauricio has embodied Orlando City since the moment he arrived at the club. More on that in a bit. Also on the board, Charlotte. We talked about Charlotte yesterday. Dean Smith and Frank Lampard apparently were part of the group that were finalists in discussing the gig. Another head coach finalist to add, according to sources, Sounders assistant Freddy Juarez. And we can catch up with Nico at 1030 and ask Nico about this. Juarez is at the final stage with Lampard, Smith, et al. Previously, the head coach at RSL before joining Seattle staff. So we'll have to bookmark Freddie Juarez and discuss that when Nico shows up at 1030. Hassan and Dom, former center back for Red Bulls, looks like he might be joining a club in Finland. 15 apps this past year for Red Bulls. So there, there is some player movement that is going on right now. Also, according to Tommy Scoops, now the Revs are fully focused on their coaching search after they've gotten rid of the baloney and they named Kurt Anolfo sporting director. Gio Savarese, Caleb Porter, Robin Frazier, Dom Kinnear, Bob Bradley. Tom Quinlan of WPRO first reported the consideration of Porter. Seth McComer, Blazing Musket, first reported Bradley, Frazier, and Kinnear. But, once again, you wonder, uh, for the same question that we had yesterday with Charlotte, with everything that went on with that front office this past year, where are you, if you are the head coach, when it comes to creative control, the pecking order, forgetting players, these kinds of things. Hey, I'd like this guy. Is it going to be a collaborative process? Because if you look at those names, Gio Savarese to me is a guy that doesn't suffer fools. And it seems like there would be some elevated uh, vocal conversations between Savarese and Cardinalfo when it came to bringing in players. Caleb Porter might be the same way. Caleb Porter also, though, might be interested in being employed in Major League Soccer. Robin Frazier, do you look at you look at the situation in Colorado with Robin Frazier not really having a whole lot of money to deal with, not a whole lot to play with, how he did there and how he would do with a budget? How much different is his budget going to be commensurate if he was to be the head coach of the Revs? What's his idea about bringing them forward? Dom Kinnear. Currently an assistant on the Cincinnati staff. Won two MLS Cups with Houston, but that was back in 2006 and 2007. Dominic Kinnear, to me, would be a a safe play. But where is Dominic Kinnear when it comes to, you know, modern day coaches? You know, is he happy just being a two? Is he just, you know, is he interviewing just for the sake of interviewing? And then Bob Bradley, Bradley for me, would want full control. He would want full control of the situation. He would uh, he would be like, well, I need to be in charge of player personnel decisions. I need to be in charge of a lot of these things that Kurt Anolfo, I would imagine, is like, no, I'm in control of that stuff now. Would Bob Bradley be happy with just being employed? I would think the answer to that would be no. So 
Gio Savarese, while an incredibly talented coach, I think would want some say in player personnel decisions, and uh, there might be a clash of styles with him and Cardinalfo. Caleb Porter, Robin Frazier. I mean, remember, Robin Frazier first won the first place in Western Conference back in 21 before the awful start in 22. Dom Kinnear, once again, you know, he hasn't been a head coach in a while. Bob Bradley, I think, would want more control. To me, that's like, you know, you and I'll bring in another New England name here. Be like Bill Parcells. Parcells, to me, you know, would want player personnel. He wants to be the GM and the head coach. So he wants to have player personnel decisions, and he wants to be the head coach. That, to me, is what Bob Bradley would want. I don't know if Bob Bradley would be happy just coaching because he wants to put his own stamp on all of this. So that, for me, would be the concern about Bob Bradley. If Bob Bradley was interested in coming back, because remember, he went to, to stay back, back in Norway. He had 11 games to keep them up and uh, keep them away from being relegated. Didn't happen. Rev's roster, remember, they signed one of the, the biggest no-brainers in the history of Earth. Signing Tomas Shankalai. Got the, they triggered that purchase option. They should have triggered that the second he walked in the door. But they triggered the purchase option. So Shankalai is there. Carlos Hill, Shankalai, Dylan Barrero. And Dylan Barrero is coming off an injury. Reminder once again, Seattle, and this is something else we'll talk to Nico about, chasing after Lanus number 10s, which I thought was something that Atlanta was supposed to. They, I thought Atlanta had the market on Lanus number 10s. Pedro De La Vega, the current Lanus number 10, Sounders have been working on a deal. If he signs, because he's 22, he'd be a young DP, and he wouldn't hit, and he'd hit the cap at only 200,000 as opposed to the 650 being a DP. That means that clubs are also permitted to use all three U22 initiative spots. Six and seven and 40 appearances in all comps for Lanús this season. He was part of the U uh, the 2019 U20 for Argentina. So we'll catch up with him about De La Vega. We mentioned Bedoya and Wagner yesterday and what uh, the latest is with them and what possibly could be returns in Philly. Do we get returns? Do players walk away? That's the other That's the other part of all of this discussion. So that's some of the news out of Major League Soccer. But once again, I mean, legitimately, I'm I'm going to be dialing back to the idea of the 3252. 3252. Now, how do you plan on locking that down? I'd love to know how you're going to lock that down. Uh, yesterday, in in the prem, I know we're kind of bouncing around here a little bit. Uh, yesterday in the Premier League, it was kind of wild. And we had a bunch of different storylines. Once again, there's action here in a three-match week. So once again, keep an eye on your fantasy teams. Keep an eye on your fantasy teams. I thought I did, thinking I was going to start Erling Holland and Julian Alvarez and be okay. I was not. Brighton and Brentford, a 2-1 win for Brighton at the Amex. Bournemouth, and we'll have news on them and uh, on their opponent, Beating Crystal Palace 2-0 yesterday at Selhurst Park. News on a couple of different fronts there at Crystal Palace. Fulham put five on Nottingham Forest. News out of Forest. Liverpool 2-0 over Sheffield United. The Chris Wilder era did not start uh, as Sheffield United fans would have planned. Remember that number was like plus 1250 or something to win. Villa over Manchester City. The big surprise yesterday. Villa with a 1-0 win at Villa Park. The... uh, Winless run for Manchester City is now at three. Manchester United beat Chelsea 2 1. And that was at Old Trafford. So today, two matches, one at 2 30 at Goodison Park, Newcastle, and Everton. Spurs hosting West Ham at 3 15. 
at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. How does how does Spurs not have a sponsor yet? How do they not have a sponsor for that stadium? I mean, legitimately, that's just how do they not have a sponsor? I know that I know that when they were, you know, you build a stadium and then you have COVID, but how do you not have a sponsor yet? Michael, you are absolutely correct. Chelsea is proof you can spend ish loads of money and still look like ish. You smell like ish too. We got some Pochettino news coming up also. But what that means with the results from yesterday, Arsenal is 36 points. Two points clear of Liverpool. Villa's at 32. They're in third. Manchester City is in fourth. Three draws in a row. They were unbeaten in their last five. That that streak is snapped. They're at 9 3 and 3, 30 points. Spurs are in fifth right now at 27. They also have a match in hand. So if they were to win today, they would be at 30 points. They'd still be in fifth because of goal difference with Manchester City. Manchester United in the barn at 27 points. Newcastle at 26. Brighton at 25. So that's like Group A that we've got. We've got Group A and like Group A minus. West Ham is in ninth at 21. Chelsea's at 19. They're only ahead of Brentford in the table because of goals scored. Chelsea at 5-4-6, and six, same goal difference as Brentford, both at 19 points, three goals scored more than Brentford. They have to go to the second tiebreaker to currently be in 10th. Fulham's at 18 points, identical record to Wolves, one more goal scored. So once again, the second tiebreaker for Wolves and Fulham. Fulham, because of what they were able to do yesterday, they're now 12th instead of 13th. Crystal Palace at 16 points. They're ahead of Bournemouth on goal difference. Nottingham Forest at 13 points at 3, 4, and 8. Luton, and this is group number three. Uh, Luton, nine points, two wins. And uh, Everton, once again, because of the, the point penalty, they're at seven points ahead of Burnley on goal difference. Sheffield United's only won once in their first 15. So that gets us into today and the news of what is going on after yesterday, et cetera. We mentioned Crystal Palace and Bournemouth, and this kind of has the the tie-in to Nottingham Forest. How pissed off are folks at Crystal Palace? An object was thrown in the direction of Roy Hodgson as he walked to the tunnel after the final whistle. Senesi scored in the 25th, Moore scored at 90 plus one to make it 2-0 for the Cherries. The object may have been a hand warmer, you know, like one of those hand packets that we shake and we put in our pocket. Former England manager wasn't struck by it, but in kept. But according to uh, our friends at uh, the Telegraph, Ivan Speck was at Selhurst Park, encapsulated the growing discontent in South London. Mass exodus after the Kiefer Moore header, added to a similar goal from Marcus Senesi in the first half. Asked about the object being thrown at him. Hodgson said, that's news to me. So you're telling me there's a fan out there who doesn't like me? Oh, well, that'll definitely stop me sleeping. Hashtag sarcasm font. It was a very sad evening for us. Tonight was not the performance that the Crystal Palace fans or that we wanted to see. The fans are who we play for at the moment. We're producing some lean fare for them. See, that's definitely a way to phrase it. I learn more about how to phrase things by reading the the uh, press conference transcriptions and things like that. We're producing some lean fare for them. Or as Michael said, you're looking like ish. I think the fans who left after the header at 90 plus one are probably sitting there saying, yeah, Crystal Palace looks like ish. We're trying to change it around. Hodgson continued. Fans have been spoiled here in recent times. The fact is that the expectations are high, hence the boos. But the fact is, fans have been spoiled here in recent times. They're used to seeing us do very well at home, get good results this year, and we've not been able to do that. Four of their last seven. Bournemouth's won four of their last seven, moving level on points with Palace. Then they broke down the match in and of itself. but. 
if there is growing discontent with Roy Hodgson at Crystal Palace, it might be the second that Steve Cooper is let go at Nottingham Forest that Crystal Palace would swoop in and grab Steve Cooper in a heartbeat. Nottingham Forest got whacked yesterday, 5-0 by Fulham. Their their owner was so mad. He was so mad. Evangelinus Maranakis. It is rumored that he threw away his credential. Because you know, owners when they want to go to a, a visiting joint, they'll get you. You know, they'll get a, they'll get their own, they'll get their own credential. They get to have to wear it around your neck. And so, someone around Craven Cottage actually found Maranakis's credential, and a picture was taken on social media. So literally, that's how mad Evangelinus Maranakis was after the five nil after the five nil loss. But what folks didn't know is that leading into that game, Maranakis was really pissed going in. And he was pissed coming out. On Tuesday, he had fired the manager at Olympiacos, another team that Maranakis owns. He fired Diego Martinez on Tuesday. So he fires a guy on Tuesday, despite Olympiacos being third in the Greek League. After they go down 4-0 in the 73rd minute, Jimenez and Awobi had each had braces at that point. They would score in the 86th. After that fourth goal with 25 minutes to go, Maranakis had seen enough. He leaves his uh, he leaves his box and apparently tosses his credential into the bushes. There's a picture of it on the in, in the Telegraph article where someone has apparently found Evangelinus Maranakis' credential from the matchup against Fulham. Literally, it was in the bushes. And so, of course, picture taken, shows up in the telegraph. Threw his accreditation lanyard into a nearby bush. He he got a lot of access. External area, stadium access. He didn't get access to the media or the hospitality area, though, or the tower. But he did get access to the tunnel, pitch side, and forecourt. Five of the eight places. Maranakis could go, but he was so mad he took his creditation and threw it in in the bushes. Cooper and his players, and I and I gave Steve Cooper a boatload of credit. Steve Cooper and his players, after the match was over, actually went over to the supporter section. They faced the fans. Steve Cooper held up his hands and apologized. There's this picture of him going like this. You know, it's like it's on me. I apologize. But the fans still would chant Steve Cooper's name to show how. He is adored there at Nottingham Forest for keeping them up last season. And remember, they're, I think they're even with the same number of wins that they were at last year at this point. Yes, they're having a bad patch right now, but Evangelinus Maranakis, the owner, has never been one to be patient. He was patient with him last year, gave him a contract extension. And so you're going through that same kind of growing pain this year, trying to find a striker. Because Brennan Johnson has moved on, and you got to find a striker. Who's taking over? Yeah, you got to put the ball in the back of the net. Ain't nobody helping you right now. Right now, Forrest has scored 16 goals in 15 matches. That puts them dangerously close to Manchester United. But 16 goals, they have Luton, who has scored the same. Crystal Palace has scored 14. Everton and Burnley have scored 15. Sheffield United has scored 11. So they are tied for 15th in goals scored. And then, you know, they, they're middle of the pack when it comes to goals allowed, but they just haven't been able to put the ball in the back of the net. You're 15th. You're tied for 15th in the Premier League in goals scored. You need to find some help, or you need to find somebody who's going to step up to do it.
Cooper after the match says it was embarrassing getting that response because I don't deserve it. Should have gotten a different reception where you have folks at Crystal Palace throwing things at Roy Hodgson, allegedly. Maybe a hot hands packet. Steve Cooper, for what he's been able to do at Nottingham Forest, he gets cheered and adored. I don't know if cheered is the right word, but he gets he gets the adoration and applause for what he's been able to do there at Nottingham Forest. All the turnover they had last year, all of the roster change that they had last year, and Steve Cooper kept them afloat. This season, you're going through the same problems. You need a striker. And right now, you're toward the bottom of the table. You're still away from that third group by about four points, but still, you're you're in that group. I don't want anyone else, this is Cooper yesterday, I don't want anyone else to be talked about apart from me. I take responsibility for this. It's all on me. I totally understand all the questions about my future, but it's something I genuinely think about the least. That said, I believe I'm the man to turn it around. I don't think about my future or my reputation. What's good for the club is good for me. That's all I care about. It was a painful night, and we deserved the scoreline. We completely came away with the required tactical and technical levels. If you don't have enough desire to defend, if you don't have the will, if you lose races, if you pull out of tackles and end up on the floor when it's 50-50, you'll get a night like tonight. I just hope it was an outlier. So, Steve Cooper has laid down the gauntlet. But will he be there to continue what's going on? Probably not, knowing the level of patience that Evangelinus Maranakis has. So, discontent at Crystal Palace, probably getting rid of Roy Hodgson if this continues. Discontent from the owner at Nottingham Forest, he'll probably get rid of Steve Cooper in short order, knowing his level of patience, parenthesis, lacking in it, closed parenthesis. Don't be surprised if A plus B equals C. If Cooper gets dismissed, if Hodgson gets dismissed, then uh, Steve Parrish and Crystal Palace picks up Steve Cooper. So we'll find out what happens there with that. So there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on in the Premier League. We mentioned, and uh, Michael had since you mentioned Chelsea. This was interesting. I thought that this was this was interesting about Chelsea and Mauricio Pochettino. Mauricio Pochettino forced the Chelsea players to watch all of the discipline problems on tape. He sat him in a room, had him watch the tape. 47 yellows and three reds. So they're averaging, what, three yellow cards a match? And they've had three reds this year. Pochettino's been forcing his players to sit through replays of them getting on the wrong side of referees to stop the disciplinary problem. Connor Gallagher, remember he got sent off, could have cost them in the 3 2 1 over Brighton, but he won't be available for Manchester. He wasn't available for Manchester United. Reese James was sent off against Newcastle. Sterling and Enzo Fernandez are now one booking away from a suspension for accumulating five yellows. So he had them all sit down and watch all of it. Watch this, watch this, watch this. And you wonder if that will kind of cool things down a little bit. You wonder. And I don't know if you were paying attention to what was going on with the Euros. The uh, Linuses will not be, or, sorry, with the Olympics. The Linuses will not be going to the Olympics. Had a 6-0 one over Scotland, but they lost out on points. And tiebreakers. 6-0 win. Two late Netherlands goals. Missed out on topping the group on goal difference. So, no England in the Olympics on the women's side. So that was a bit of a shocker as well. Uh, gossip rumor and innuendo. There's some, there's a Hillsborough story I want to get into in a little bit and we'll get into it, but, uh, well, yeah, we'll get, we'll get into that in a, in a bit, 
But uh, gossip, rumor, and innuendo. Once again, Nico Moreno coming up bottom of the hour. And we'll go over everything Major League Soccer. So who's going where? Who could maybe? Who could maybe not? All right. Our long national nightmare might be over. Real Madrid are ready to offer Kylian Mbappe the deal. But he's got to have an answer by January 15th. So you've got five weeks. If I'm in Mbappe's camp, you're telling me I've got five weeks? You're telling me that? You so you're telling me. Let me let me get this straight. So so you're telling me that I only have five weeks to tell you whether I've got yes or no. I don't know. Is that that's that's interesting. You gotta line up your finances, I guess. Richarlison is a target for the Saudi Pro League. Spurs unlikely to sell for less than $60 million, which is what they paid Everton for him. Spurs are also considering signing Ben Godfrey in January from Everton. Tom, Ropes, et al., what do you think? Juve set to pull out of a deal to sign Jaden Sancho. Forward Noni Madueke wants to leave Chelsea over a lack of playing time. Yesterday, we mentioned about Frank Lampard and Dean Smith competing for the gig at Charlotte FC with Freddie Juarez. Newcastle's Tino Livramento, who qualifies to play for Scotland and Portugal, wants to prove he's good enough for England. Liverpool have made an approach for Benfica's 18-year-old Dutch forward Keanu Lorenzo Silva. West Ham will listen to offers for Spain midfielder Pablo Fornals in January, despite triggering the one-year extension to his contract. Remember, as we always say, You trigger a contract extension, you sign somebody to a long-term deal, it is to control the asset. It's not because you like the guy. Might be because you like the guy, but it's also to control the asset. You sign Mihailo Mudrik to an eight-year deal, you're controlling the asset for eight years. If he stays for the eight years, fantastic. You got what you were looking for out of him. You might have broken even. But if somebody wants to come by, and, and Mihailo Mudrik is, you know, going gangbusters. Somebody wants to knock on your door. Hey, Brooke, can we get him from you? Then, once again, the player is stuck in the contract. The team can sit there and go, okay, yeah, sure. What's it worth to you? It's about controlling the asset. Always remember that. West Ham must pay more than 40 million pounds if they want Inter Milan midfielder Hakan Kalinoglu. That's from Calcio Mercato. West Ham and Crystal Palace keen on a January move for PSG's forward Hugo Ekitike. Football insider, two-hour point about Steve Cooper. Once again, football insider wants to take the information as you wish. And this was yesterday before the match. Cooper expects to be sacked soon. Well-placed sources told Football Insider, and I like how they put put themselves in boldface type, that Cooper has told friends he's aware of the whispers about his position. And it's been one win in 11. Cooper has previously twice come close to losing his job, September of 22 and in the spring of of this year. Growing sense that that his time is ending. Sources say the ex Swansea boss has let it be known to his inner circle that he does not expect to be manager at Forest much longer. Under contract until June of 2025. Maranakis is eyeing a return on his investment this year, and Football Insider, in all caps and boldface, revealed on November 30 he's targeting a top 10 Premier League finish as pressure grows on Cooper. Newcastle has put a 25 million pound price tag on Jacob Murphy by the way. So if so so if 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 say somebody's mad 
Evangelinus Maranakis. If Evangelinus Maranakis is that mad about what's going on, then you're looking for a top 10 finish. Ain't that far from top 10. You are six points out of top 10 right now. I think that speaks more to the league on the whole. As we talk about groups A, B, and C. But, dude, you're two wins out of being in 10th. But Evangelinus Marinakis has not been one to exhibit a whole lot of patience. AC Milan are prepared to sign Arsenal's 23-year-old defender Jakub Kivior on loan with an obligation to buy. Arsenal are tracking USA and Haydick split midfielder Rokas Puchtas. That's from the three-letter paper. Take the information at your own peril. France keeper Mikey Magnon may not sign a new AC Milan deal because Manchester United are among the clubs showing an interest. Next time Nick pops in, we'll ask about that. City and United have made moves for Lille's 18-year-old French defender, Lenny Yoro, who has a contract until 2025. So once again, Lille, smart business here. We have a young defender. He's under contract. Would you be interested in him? Okay, great, fine, cool. Here's the deal, though. you got to pay the man. We have a figure. We have a number in our head. What do you think that number is? Well, I'll tell you what that number is. It's probably a lot bigger than you think. So that's what you're looking at with uh, stuff in the Prem. Liverpool have extended their partnership with Carlsberg for another 10 years. Started in 1992, by the way. Joining up together until 2034. So there's that. Interesting story out of France. QSI has sold a minority stake in PSG to U.S.-based private investment firm Arctos Partners. First thing to note, according to Peter Rutzler at The Athletic, one-eighth without any influence on on, on on-field sporting matters. So it is a one-eighth interest in PSG, 12.5%. No change to the club hierarchy. PSG are now not solely owned by Qatar now, but QSI will retain full control over decisions at PSG. It's not an agreement with a view to eventually buying a minority stake, according to Rutzler. For Arctos, its key focus, furthering PSG's global growth, lifestyle brand, popular outside the sport, all that. For the club, the arrival of Arctos will also provide financial support in women's sports development, and particularly PSG's other infrastructure investments and projects. They recently opened the new 300 million euro training facility west of town. And they have plans either to renovate the Parc de Prince or, if necessary, relocate. They want the, they want to own, PSG wants to own their own stadium outright. Obviously, you've got political stumbling blocks there. And so they're looking at a new site altogether or relocation to the Stade de France if they can't own the Parc de France. 12.5% stake that would value PSG at about four and a quarter billion euro or about 4.6 billion US dollars. So that came across this morning. Burnley winger Luca Colioscio has been ruled out for an extended period because of an knee injury. Suffered it in a collision in the loss to uh, Wolves. Steve Cooper, by the way, according to Paul Taylor at The Athletic, expects to be in charge at Wolves. Challenges players to show fans what it means to them to play for the club at Molyneux. Virgil van Dyke says he's going to help Joel Matip in recovery from his ACL injury. Ruptured his ACL in last weekend's win over Fulham. Now will undergo surgery. Contracts expiring next summer, and the 32-year-old doesn't know what what his future may hold. Chelsea women's defender Anyik Nguyen has sustained an ACL injury, and uh, she is going to be out and was on international duty uh, for the Netherlands U23s. Uh, other, let me go to Sky and see if we missed anything when it came to the other gossip news and innuendo and rumors and papers and things like that. And we'll get into what to watch, where to watch it, and the other news going on. 
Uh, news about Paul Pogba coming up in just a sec. According to our friends at Sky, and once again, this is from the four-letter paper, so take the information at your own peril. They're trying to line up Julian Lopetegui, meaning Forrest, sacking Steve Cooper, Julian Lopetegui, Marco Silva, among the individuals that could be uh, figured out as the uh, successor. Mirror, Spurs boss Anish Postacoglu has offered an update on James Madison's recovery from the ankle injury he picked up last month, describing it as a slow burner. Kevin De Bruyne has been included in Manchester City's FIFA Club World Cup squad, raising hopes of a return sometime soon. Daily Telegraph, we mentioned Tino Livramento. We also mentioned Hugo Akatike from the Evening Standard and uh, The Athletic. Manchester United unlikely to make any signings. Morning, Abby. Shag Samiak at sundown for those celebrating the Festival of Lights. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you once again for subscribing. Manchester United unlikely to make any signings in the January transfer window, according to Eric Ten Hag. We'll see there. And Saarbrücken in the third division of German football. Knocked out Bayern Munich in the previous round of the DFB Pokal. They beat Eintracht Frankfurt 2-0, so they've taken two rather large wins in the tournament. So good work by our friends at Saarbrücken as they continue to uh, knock out folks there. Spurs have rejected a Swansea approach for Ange Postacoglu's number two, Chris Davies. Deli Alley's feeling good on course to make an Everton return in the new year. And so there's there's plenty of stuff going on right now when it comes to the activity in uh, the game overseas. And we talked about Christine Sinclair yesterday and what she has been able to do. It's been amazing. Uh, the Hillsborough thing. This is what I wanted to get into about Hillsborough. David Kahn was around uh, earlier this week. It was yesterday. And now, and full disclosure, I have donated to the Hillsborough Family Support Group. I have the scarf to prove it right there. And there have been some amazing programs about uh, the cover-up from the police. Panorama on BBC did amazing work when it came to exposing everything that, that went on when it came to the Hillsborough tragedy. David Kahn says, given that the government took six years to respond to the 2017 report at commission from James Jones, the former bishop of Liverpool, aimed at learning lessons from the Hillsborough scandal, the day of publication, always likely to fall into the more recent series of letdowns rather than celebrations. Family members who gathered at a home office building near the Liverpool waterside to be told of the government's measures responded with the resolve that has formed the indomitable core of their 34th cause, especially with uh, Margaret Espinal that uh, has been a part and parcel to it. And Jared will be joining us here in a sec. Hillsborough law developed after 2016, after the 2016 verdict. New inquest into how the overcrowding and crush were caused at the stadium jur jury rejected the campaign of lies by the South Yorkshire police who sought to blame the victims for the disaster rather than take responsibility for their own monumental failings. Hillsborough law proposals would introduce a legally enforceable positive duty of candor for police and all public authorities to assist investigations into a major incident and equal public funding for legal representation of bereaved families at inquiries and inquests. Draft laws aimed at ensuring that other people do not suffer police cover-ups, disdain, appalling treatment as the Hillsborough families did, and they've relentlessly impressed on the government their commitment to this as a positive legacy from their nightmare struggle. So that was proposed yesterday as well. We wake, we uh, welcome in Jared Smith, Nico Moreno, joining us in about 10 minutes. What is on your mind this morning? Right, first and foremost, how are you? Uh, recovering, slowly, but recovering. Which is always a plus. Yeah, it's always a plus, man. Uh, um, I saw Joey Barton was being stupid. I, I assume Joey Barton had something to push, and so he just decided that um, 
he would say something controversial because in some people's minds, you know, you know, any press is good press. Also, I'm very proud of him for learning the word eunuch. I'm sure he spent many an hour looking over the thesaurus and asking multiple people on the street how to pronounce that word correctly. Yes. Um, and he's very proud of himself for it. And I think we should all give him a little, uh, little golf clap for, uh, for, for learning, 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 you know, big boy words. Yeah. Especially, you know, words that may not be a whole lot of Scrabble points, but have a whole lot of meaning attached. <sighs> I, you know, I went into the idea. We got we discussed Joey in hour number one. He was opening kickoff for round one of stupidity down here today, and I, I mentioned, and I'm, I don't know, you know, that there are tremendously talented individuals who comment on the game on a daily basis, and I mentioned Jess by name, on purpose. Because of what she has been able to build. And we have friends in the business who have built incredible careers for themselves. But because of the Joey Barton shtick, I mentioned Jess in our number one as an individual who has played the game and is now on XMFC. And she gets called to do a lot of TV and has never met uh, a live opportunity that she hasn't turned down to talk about the game, whether it's Charlotte or women or men or what have you. And the, the word that I used with Joey Barton was Neanderthal. In addition to wanting to try to draw attention to yourself, it's an outdated opinion. And I guess since, uh, and I mentioned also that since Joey has been fired from being a manager in the lower divisions in England that he can't comment on being a manager because he's been fired in the past. We can comment on being a manager. He can just comment on how to do it incorrectly. Yes, that's true. Um, like I said, I, I, I'm assuming that Joey has something new coming out that he needs to push and decided to just go get some publicity for it. Um, Look, man, like it, it is it is the classic of you do not feed the trolls kind of thing. Yeah. And it, there there comes a time when stuff like this happens where I'm like, oh, there there appears often to be an angle behind someone just deciding to jump all the way out of their pocket with this stuff, where they just decide to start firing off and then decide to start like answering all of the answering all of the tweets that are sent back kind of in belittlement. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just assume that he has something else going on that he's trying to either stay in the public eye or he's got something coming up and he wants the name association with it, whatever floats his boat, I guess. Um, I don't know, man, people, people pick the weirdest hills to get on. And then, yeah, it's, it, it, is it ever really worth the amount of the amount of nonsense that you're going to have to put up with? Probably not, but in his eyes, it might be, um, it is what it is. Um, it, that one is more of a metaphorical uh, bus fire, whereas in Brazil they're having literal bus fires. Yes. I mean, this is what happens when your team gets relegated for the first time in 111 years. Santos relegated in Brazil. I, I mean, this is like Pele's club, Santos. Yeah, when you hear Santos of Brazil – First, you know, and my T-shirts prove it. First guy that you think of is Pele. First time in 111 years that they've been relegated. And so outside the stadium, and Nico Contour has the video up on his 280 character app, by the way, uh, as does uh, Luis Michel Eshigaray. And you got people setting stuff on fire right behind the stadium. I mean, the stadium was an absolute mess as it seemed like fans were you know, turning everything upside down. And you're like, seriously? I mean, but yeah, when you're that mad, that's what's going to happen sometimes. And sure enough, literally, Santos relegated for the first time and they got cars on fire down the block and the stadium was torn up. And of course, there are those of us, you know, in the, you know, in the news media who are sitting there and they're trying to figure out, okay, how can we, you know, how can we get the pictures of this? How can we get the pictures up? And you got firefighters trying to fight it from the top levels of the stadium, trying to douse the car fires that are absolutely, that are like 20 feet below. I mean, don't get relegated, I guess, is the, is the lesson. I mean, that's, that's like the life goal is don't get relegated. Um, 
it's kind of like the uh, it's, uh, again metaphorical versus literal car fire. Uh, Joey Barton broke the one rule, which is on the Bird app, um, the app that used to be Bird. There's one rule. Every day there is a main character, and your goal is to not be it. Uh, Joey Barton sought that out today. Um, your goal is to not be relegated, and uh, it, it seems that it seems that they, they 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 broke that rule. And they one got, of they got they got that ass relegated. One of the players' cars was one of the cars that was put on fire. Steven Mendoza's car was burned to the ground. I mean, you should be thankful he's not in France. Um, True. Because the, the, like of, of all of the countries, like yeah, we're gonna people are gonna make their their shot. Like people are gonna fire off on the hip at Brazil about this. Um, hey, at least you're not France. Yeah, because that's the one we should. Um, that's the ones we should be like burying under, you know, eight feet of concrete. Is the way their fans have been acting recently in the, in the domestic leagues in France? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, it's like they're they're they are they are liable to make the uh, the Brazilian fans look like some of them look like amateurs like brazil gonna have to eat some weedies and get <laughs> yeah. loose because 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 man what the french have been done, doing lately is is uh pretty embarrassing but uh, yeah that's um i guess there's a first time for everything and again got that ass relegated don't so, get your don't, don't get your ass relegated don't get your ass relegated um where, so. where is your phone in relation to your earpiece mine yes it is sitting down here while i have a headset plugged into it Okay, because I'm hearing the, the scratchy feedback. Things. Oh, that's me also cleaning my desk off because uh, ah. the child left like Play Doh all over. Oh, okay. Um, uh, she was making something this morning and she left Play Doh on my work desk and now I'm trying to clean it off so it doesn't dry and stick there. Ew! The heat death of the universe. Ew! Send the yeah, kid to your house. Yeah, really? I mean, tonight, uh, to, to Ricky's point, we do have the Copa America draw tonight at 7.30. And it, it should be very, very interesting about what uh, what goes down tonight. Uh, and I have uh, right now. Here's how it lays out: Pot one, Argentina, Mexico, U.S., and Brazil. Pot two, Uruguay, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Pot three, Chile, Panama, Venezuela, Paraguay. Pot four, Jamaica, Bolivia, and the two winners from Jerry World. That's what you're staring at. And we were looking, you know, and the pot one guys, they all go into different places. Argentina goes in one group. Mexico goes in a group. U.S. goes in a group. Brazil goes in a group. Then the fun begins. Trying to figure out who is going to be put in all of these, in all of these locations. Once again, tonight at 730. It's on uh, FS1, and yeah, you know, who knows? We might, I might even have something. Might even have something after the fact that we'll post in the morning. But once again, reminder: tomorrow morning is going to be flipped. Uh, Prem and proper gets released in the morning, and SDH is in the PM because I have to be at Mercedes Benz Stadium to prepare for high school football championships. Programming next week, outside of Monday, it's going to be morning update. With Jason Drew, Maddie et al. Afternoon update with Jason Drew, Maddie et al. Because we're in the, the the transfer window and the trade window and free agency and waivers and all that kind of stuff for Major League Soccer. Uh, morning show Monday might be a power hour, and then an afternoon update. So then all week long it's going to be morning update, afternoon update, as we go through and navigate Major League Soccer's. Uh, trade windows and such. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are the championships. You'll see what I look like without makeup, but with makeup and a suit on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Hey, Thursday, man, that's the only reason I watch the state championships every year. To, to see, to see yeah. me wearing makeup and a suit? Yep. Wow. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, Ricky wants to know if there are any parameters to how many CONCACAF teams can be in a group. I have yet to hear. Not a, not I don't, a clue, man. Yeah, and just don't be surprised if it if it looks a little odd by the time the night's over. And uh, so you got uh, so when Nico comes on, we will we will discuss uh, Copa America in addition to everything else. And we might might address Copa America first since that's what we're talking about right now. But pot one, Argentina, Mexico, U.S., Brazil, they go into different groups. Then we got to talk about who to avoid. 
and who you want in your bracket. You know, who who do you want in your group? You know, if you do, if if uh, who do you want? That's the that's the biggest thing here. You know, but the the standings when it comes to uh, comma ball qualifying right now. You know, you um, let me dig that up real quick so I can sit there and go. Okay, so uh, here's what we're staring at: qualifier standings. Okay. I love how FIFA says, they think it's over, it's not over. All right, so Argentina, obviously, top of the group. Uruguay, Uruguay and Colombia are the only other two teams that are in double digits right now in points. So Uruguay and Colombia, they are both in pot two. So you're probably, it's a good chance... It's a good chance that you get one of those in your group. We'll kind of walk through this. 50% chance, Ricky says, 50% chance we get U.S. versus Joseph or U.S. versus Miggy at the Benz on the 27th. Yeah, and both of those are just going to be burned down the house kind of nights. If you well, get and so is the, yeah, and so is that and first And so is the pack. first one. Um. Depending on who Argentina plays, it could get Ooh. it could get it could get stupid real fast. Oh my god! So I mean, yeah, right now you're probably going to get are the Uruguay or Colombia in your group, and uh, you want to make sure that you navigate that one. Then Venezuela, Ecuador, Brazil. I mean, do you want Brazil right now? You know, I'd sit there and go, you know, I, I don't ever really want Brazil to be but fair. They just, but they've just not been good. I know, but I don't really want them. You don't want to be their get right game. No, that's true. But thankfully, Brazil is in a different pot. Like than they, people they wanted Alabama after the Texas game. <laughs> like people were fine with it. Like, oh man, maybe, maybe this, maybe this Alabama can be, uh, be knocked around a little bit. Then yeah. uh, I see I and I subscribe to the theory at this point. If we're going to put on our uh, tinfoil hats, sure. uh, that th- Saban started a uh, oh, oh what's his face against USF and to drive the point home of like hey y'all want to see what the other side looks like? I'm going to start this cat and then the next week I'm going to go back and start Jalen Milrow and y'all won't know why. I started uh-huh. Milrow. Exactly. No, uh, Saban's going to win a national title again and darkness will befall the land for a thousand years. As long as he doesn't have to use a kicker. Uh, bottom four teams right now in common ball qualifiers. Paraguay, Chile, Bolivia, Peru. So Paraguay, Chile, they're both in pot three. Peru is in pot two. That's who you want. Out of pot two, that's who you want. You want Peru uh, as a part of your discussion. And uh, because they haven't won. In the first six matches in common ball qualifying, they're 0-2 and 4. They've only scored one goal. Bolivia has given up a lot. They've only scored they've scored four, but they've given up 14. So Paraguay, Chile, Bolivia, Peru is what you're staring at for those bottom four. Paraguay, Chile, pot three. Peru is in pot two. So you've got a little bit of separation. And then Bolivia is in pot four. Jamaica's in pot four. I want nothing to do with Jamaica, considering that Andre Mm-mm. put in net. I nope. don't want that. No, you don't really want anything to do with them. Um, give me the inevitable Jamaica-Mexico game where everyone just gets completely sideways. Because <laughs> um, that one's always drunk. Yes. So if you ended up with, if you end up with like Jamaica-Mexico mm-hmm. in the same group, like in that group two, mm-hmm. that'd be fun. That'd be that'd be absolutely sexy. So uh, I'm looking forward to what's uh, what's going on. And since it is the last hour, a half hour of the show on a Thursday, that means that we waste no time. We waste no time. Bring in Nico Moreno from Seattle. Nico, what is up, my friend? What's going on, John? We Jerry. Yeah. Of course, family yep. of SDH. Happy to be here with you guys. Excited for the, the big final in MLS. Excited to talk to y'all. So let's get it going. Okay. Well, we were we were talking before, and I, and I was kind of filibustering a little bit. I admit I was stalling. Copa America draws tonight at uh, seven thirty Eastern, and I know we're going to talk about 
you know, MLS Cup and all that kind of stuff. But Copa America draws tonight. And right now, the way things are laid out, you got your pot one. Everybody sets aside Argentina, Mexico, U.S., and Brazil. Pot two, Uruguay, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Pot three, Chile, Panama, Venezuela, Paraguay. Pot four, Jamaica, Bolivia, and the two winners at Jerry World coming up in March. If you are any of those dudes in pot one, who do you want in your group and who do you want to avoid? Remind, uh, remind me the, the, the uh, teams for pot one? Pot one, Argentina, Mexico, U.S., Brazil. They get to go into their groups. That, that's your pot one. So that Argentina, Mexico, U.S., and Brazil, that's pot one. They're the dudes. Right. They're, they're in their groups. They're individual spots. Uruguay, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru is pot two. Pot three, Chile, Panama, Venezuela, Paraguay. Pot four, Jamaica, who Jarrett and I are like, I don't want to touch them with Andre Blake in that. Jamaica, Bolivia, and the two playoff winners in Dallas in March. If I'm setting up a group, and we'll probably end up talking about this later in like next week and stuff, but who do you want in your group and who do you not? Oh, well, I mean, that's simple. I think that there's some uh, of uh, the South American teams that have not just issues now, but they've had issues consistently. I think Bolivia, uh, I think Venezuela's been struggling as well. Um, um, I think that you don't want to have anything to do with Uruguay. Uh, you don't want anything to do uh, with Argentina. Um I really don't think you want to deal with the host either. I mean, that, that that's that's a, a one that you want to avoid in, in general senses. Uh, I think Colombia has a very good team right now. Uh, I think Brazil, like I mentioned a couple of shows ago when we went over the uh, qualifiers at the time, uh, I think that they're not as strong as they usually are. I think that they're in the middle of a broken process. So I think that's a team that you could upset. So you don't have to necessarily look away from them. Uh, I'm, I'm with you guys on Jamaica. I think Jamaica uh, athletically, I think Jamaica in terms of what they've been doing lately, uh, having a core group together, um, they're, they're, they're going to be a challenging team no matter what. I think Panama on the very low key side are starting to build something down there and they're going to have a lot of support here in the States. Um, so I, I guess that's some of the teams that you want to stay away from. Um, and then again, uh, even Mexico with all the support that they have, I think they're going to really struggle to get some traction. Uh, there's been a ton of bad press recently on uh Mexico, they've they've struggled in games. They've struggled outside of games. Uh, there's a whole bunch of discussion about who should be called up and is Raul Jimenez finally finding some form because he had a couple of goals uh, this weekend. So I think that there's such a kind of convoluted team at the moment that they're going to struggle as well. Uh, so it's going to be a very interesting one. Um, in terms of Copa America here, because you'll see the support from each specific nation here in the States, but there are some struggling teams within CONCACAF that might be a surprise to either get out early or just not be able to really find their way past even the first round. No doubt about it. Jarrett, MLS conversation. Kick it. All right. Last time we talked, we all agreed that Houston would beat LAFC, and we were all <laughs> wrong, and I am still reeling from Benny Ball not uh, not finishing the drill for this season. Um, alas, here we sit with uh, Columbus, who came back, and I, I had said earlier this week that Cincinnati pulled a Minnesota – a Minnesota, a Minnesota choking act that they did at your house up in Seattle a couple years ago where they had it and then they let it go. Um, but now we got Columbus and we have LAFC. Uh, what are your thoughts on this cup final? I love it. I think that uh, they've both earned it. I think that you have uh, two of the more impressive teams throughout the playoffs for various reasons. Uh, 
and look, I'm not a pragmatic style of soccer type, uh, but I have learned to respect it a little bit. So the fact that LAFC has kind of reinvented themselves throughout this playoffs have been very interested uh, in two parts. One, set pieces. They were not very effective offensively, off defensively throughout the regular season. And they've just turned into this elite team when it comes to both of those things, right? Uh, it seems like they get either a near shot or a goal just about every time there's a corner kick or a free kick. They've really been able to squeeze the lemon uh, uh, out of that, uh, the juice out of a lemon that wasn't there during the regular season. And then for their style of play, Chirundolo has kind of turned into this team that is just saying, hey, look, we don't need possession of the ball. We're going to play in transition. We're going to be effective. Uh, at times, we're going to hit you in the half spaces. At times, we're going to push it out wide. Uh, we're going to be careful. We're going to take our moments. Um, so I find it interesting that he was able to just kind of flip the switch on that. And in the last two games against Seattle, um, and against Dynamo, they had no problem just sitting back, uh, playing defensively, giving uh, the opponent the ball, and either allowing them to just pass it around uh, horizontally or uh, in their own space or just forcing them to either uh, mid-range shots or just having to just cross the ball into the box where Cellini and Mauricio have been really impressive. Uh, so I just think that that's been really, really good in terms of LAFC and how they've kind of changed it. And then Columbus, in a complete clash of that, they've told you what they're going to do from the beginning of the season till now. You know they're going to be offensive. They're going to punch you in the face. They're never out of any game. They were down 2-0 against Cincinnati, and they kind of felt like they had not just more chances, but more fuel in the tank. Uh, they're conditioning that is one of Wilfred Nancy's I think biggest emphasis uh, as being a coach I've talked to several players that have been with him uh, in his last two teams and he's like man he likes athletes he he wants to make sure that you're running that you know condition is a big part of it and he paid due against Cincinnati so the fact that we have two clashing systems one that's been the same from the beginning of the season till today and now LAFC playing a more pragmatic and allowing you the ball is going to be very interesting how that plays out. Love the star component of it as well. Buanga on one side, Cucho and Diego Rossi on the other. Carlos Vela, his last LA last run with LAFC. Uh, so there's just so many underlines that I'm just excited about the final. To me, it almost seems like LAFC is like Rocky and Rocky Two. It's like you're you're fighting right handed. It, it literally is like you're used to you're used to Rocky being the I like lefty. that. You're being Rocky's used to being the lefty, and Steve Chirundolo is Mickey, and he's like teaching he's teaching LAFC to fight right handed. And then in the fifteenth round, when when you know when Mickey yells now, that's when you start going back to fighting left handed, and, and you get the knockout and you get the you get the belt over Apollo Creed. I mean, it's just at times. It's unwatchable, but when you, you, it's almost Red Bulls like, where they have thirty percent possession against uh, Houston, but once again, if you get the turnover and you're clinical and you're up, it doesn't matter what the possession numbers are. You've got a lead, and the other team's got a chase, and you can just lock it down and sit there and go, "Okay, look, we got a lead. We don't need the ball anymore. Go for it and try to work it through." And that's what we're seeing, I think, from LAFC right now. Yeah, hundred percent. I don't know if Jerry has a thought on it, but uh, I'm totally with you. And they, they they've been able to kind of turn a team that uh, has specific players to do certain things uh, into creating or adding now new dimensions to their game. I mean, Hollingstead is a guy that I wouldn't call a defensive a fullback and yet he's done very well just sitting back allowing uh, at times Ilya to kind of come in between those two center backs whenever Palacios is out and then whenever Hollingstead's going to push out then Palacios stayed and if you follow Palacios career he's another guy who's number one 
forte and attribute is his ability on the ball and pushing forward. And now he's just physical. Uh, well, he's going to be physical, but his stance defensively, his technique, his ability to push the one-on-one -on -one outside of his lines. I mean, he's just been very good. Uh, and I would say that uh, Kalini as well throughout this time in MLS where constantly maybe at times he was exposed for his lack of speed and things like that. Across this playoffs, they've had him so deep, always with uh, numbers behind the ball, that he's just looked great. He's just been able to sit back in that box and just dominate with his experience, his location on the ball, the way he kind of leads that back line. So because of that, man, I, I think it's impressive. No, I agree with you. And um, it's funny because you talk about Keely. Uh -oh. <laughs> Jared hit the magic button. Here he comes. Hang on. Yeah, that's all right. No, I mean, keep, keep. oh, there you go. Here we oh, go. Hey, uh, no, I wonder. I wondered if Chiellini was going to be that target point when they played Seattle, when they came up to y'all's house. In that, if you could get, if if Brian Smetzer being as good as he is at putting that team in a position to be successful, if you were going to get situations where you were going to ask Chiellini to try and keep with Jordan Morris, but they've done such a good job of protecting him but and also putting him in a position to be successful and not asking him to do too much of the physical work outside of just being a smart good defender who does so much of his work ahead of time in the sense like we had one of those in Atlanta we had Michael Parkers who was physically limited compared to other center backs but he did so much work before the ball was even played with positioning um and and getting into shape that it didn't really matter by the end of it all. And it's 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 very impressive the way Toronto has made it work. I don't know how much gas Keelini has in the tank left. The 39. After, yeah, after this season. And and you know, Nico talked about it with Vela as well. Like, man, look, Vela, this isn't 2019 anymore. Vela does not look like 2019 Vela. No. But if he can and and this will be one that you know we talked about the other day. Darlington Nagby had a great game against Cincinnati. Oh, and Tanagby started to get long in the tooth. I don't think he can give you all of those insane games week after week after week anymore, but he can pull it out. Can Carlos Vela give you 60 minutes, give or take, in this cup final as kind of his 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 uh his magnum opus? Yeah, and look, another interesting thing about all this is that LAFC could very well go back to their regular season form and maybe do it differently against Columbus because maybe just maybe when you have a team as strong offensively as Columbus maybe you don't give them as much possession maybe you don't allow them to get into the flow of the game so I I'm still not sure if Chirundo is going to come in the final with the exact same tactics and that's interesting because I couldn't really say that about LAFC before and you're right I mean with uh, Carlos Vela and I think Christian Oliveira has gave them something differently because they've had struggled to really have that freedom of that top three players usually were very free and they would move around and sometimes Carlos would push out and sometimes Dennis Buanga would come in but the but the right side was just not as good at that ability to just switch Oliveira has been fantastic. You might not see it in the stats. You might not see it in assists or goals, but his movement, the the way he kind of plays off of Vela, the way he plays off of Hollingstead uh, when he comes forward. I mean, he's just been so good that maybe, just maybe, if LAFC decides, hey, we're not going to play in transition and we're not going to just sit back, Maybe things change. Maybe Carlos Vela comes in a little bit later. Maybe in this one, uh, 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 it, they, they kind of switch things around. And uh, maybe Mario Gonzalez starts in this one as more of a target nine. Um, so I just don't really know what to expect from LAFC. I know what I'm going to expect from Will for Nancy. And that doesn't mean that it's any easier to defend because they just have been really hard to stop in general senses. So... I think that's what's interesting about how these LAFC things will come around. But let's give credit to Wilfred and, and the way he kind of has installed this confidence in this team where they're never out of things, where he knows exactly what each one of these players is going to give them. Um, 
Will Gressel start in this one, or is it Farsi? Farsi has been really, really good in the back and forth, but you saw what Gressel did when he came in against Cincinnati, simply because of the services into the box, his ability to create opportunities. Uh, I want to say when he came on in the few touches he had in that time, he might have created five opportunities uh, of, of clear chances. So he just was so good on the ball that – I'm I'm trying to figure out exactly what's going to happen on that side, but they're going to be the exact same team, and that's because of Wilfred Nancy, right? Uh, Christian Ramirez is a guy that you can call off the bench, and he's going to give you absolutely everything. He's going to push. He's going to occupy the defenders. He's going to give Cucho a lot more space. He's going to allow Matan to do other things. So it, it's just a really, really good final in terms of – Different tactics, different schemes, but right now I couldn't tell you how LAFC is going to set up against this very good Columbus squad. Well, and I think to your point, I'm, I'm digging up the, the numbers courtesy of our friends at SofaScore, looking up uh, Julian's numbers when he came into uh, when he came into the match, and you you're you're like, okay, what what am I staring at here? Well, it'd be nice if Cincinnati could tell me what's going on with Columbus. That'd be great. Uh, Columbus subs. This is what happens with live radio and things don't behave. Uh, now that's all right, but I mean, you know, if I give you some time to to go ahead and do I that, fifty five. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Fifty five minutes on the board. Uh, forty one touches, nineteen of twenty four passing at seventy nine percent. Five key passes, three of nine on crosses. Uh, zero for three on duels. He lost possession thirteen times. He was fouled one. Had one foul. Had one clearance and two picks. So. Uh, that's what you get from Julian Gressel. But I think to your point is if LAFC is Rocky and they come out the way they did in, in the first Rocky movie, if Rocky comes out the way that he is slugging away, they're going to be offensive, then to me that means it's Mo Farsi on the right-hand side. Right. If LAFC comes out and it's going to be like they are in Rocky Two, where they're fighting right-handed and they're waiting for the 15th round to come in and fight lefty, then it's Julian because of Julian's defensive defensive deficiency. Say that 10 times fast. Farsi being the better defender, I think, would be up against that LAFC rush that we're used to seeing. If you want to be the better team offensively and try to get points on the board early, then it might be Julian starting, knowing that there's some defensive issues there with Julian. That left-hand side, though, if Julian is on the right-hand side, that left-hand side to me is screaming Denny Buwanga. Yeah. If Farsi and Buanga, I think that that benefits Columbus. If it's Gressel on that right-hand side with Buanga attacking on the left, that is Buanga and feed him all day long. 100%. And the duels are going to be key in this one, right? Because you can't just ignore a guy like Dennis Buanga any moment in the game. We saw exactly what he did against Seattle in a couple of moments, against the Dynamo. I thought it was great the way at times he was a bit of a decoy. Uh, he kept Dorsey... Real, real deep, uh, which is something you don't really got to see from Houston. And, and one of the reasons why I thought they were so ineffective in the attacking then, because Coco Carrasquilla, he likes to come inside and leave Dorsey that 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 end. So they didn't have a lot of width, and a lot of the possession that they were able to have was without purpose and, and was really ineffective uh, for what they were trying to do with the ball. They just don't have that creative player. So. In in that sense, I think that those matchups with Dennis Buanga and how that plays out is going to be very important to, to just look at all around. And in the midfield, right, uh, can this Columbus team with Nagby, with Adia Moritz has been very good, maybe just not just dictate tempo, but make that 4-3-3, three, three, the, the, the way they stand, just become a lot more defensive and force him even if LAFC decides to play differently and be on the attack they're gonna have to be careful where Nagby is they're gonna have to be careful with Eddie and Morris is the way they push back and forth uh so the, the duels in this one are going to be very very interesting Jared go for it hey, you talk about the duels man and how it is and that's I, I think my thing is trying to figure out that Russell situation or Farsi situation for me just how we talked about pragmatism. How pragmatic does how pragmatic does Wolfer Nancy want to be? Because I, we can tell you, I can tell you, having watched him here, 
as much as Gressel can create, he can also get sucked up the field and leave that gap back there where it would make it, if if I'm going to be risk averse, it would make me nervous about getting beat in an almost identical way that Seattle got beat by by Boanga. Yep. Where you get up the field, we know that Columbus plays so aggressively, and you leave that exact space open for LAFC, and they showed you they really only need one chance. I think that would be my fear, but at the same time, they're just Cincinnati or sorry, Columbus plays with such such a willingness to just absolutely go for it that I, I don't want I can't sit here and say ah, he'll be pragmatic will he like will he though <laughs> yeah. yeah no 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 I mean it, uh, quite honestly <laughs> I mean I, I, it, it's hard to uh, call the style necessarily super pragmatic uh, but you know is he going to be cautious with that side uh, yeah and I think that he learned a lot from the Cincinnati game and the way they kind of held Barrial and Bupensa was forced to be pushed farther in those inside channels because uh, I thought Farsi and Morera did such a good job on that right side. I think their left side uh, with Jabo is a little bit more subjective to getting beat. Um, can Christian Oliveira be the X factor? Uh, I, I don't know but I, I would if I'm uh, Wilfred I'd rather have uh, Oliveira beat me, then Buanga beat me. So uh, because of that, I think Farsi will start. I was just kind of providing, you oh. know, a little bit of how 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 surprised I was with with Gressel. Yeah. And another reason why I don't think he's going to sit Farsi is because he had a pretty bad game, and, and I don't think you want to take away his confidence completely by saying, "Hey, you had one bad game this playoff run, and I'm going to take you out, and I'm going to just sit you." Um, so because of that, I also think he's going to go with Farsi. Yeah, I think it's going to be Farsi and Marrera on the right-hand side because if you if you leave Buanga to just go up against Marrera, no doubt Marrera's had a great uh, postseason, but you need that support there with Farsi and Marrera going up whatever's coming down the left-hand side. Uh, I do want to get in a Seattle question before we go, so let's get in your prediction. What do you think is going to happen here? Because folks want to know. Abby wants to know who you're picking. I'm thinking Columbus, man. Uh, I, I've – been really high on them all season long. Um, I did have them in my bracket losing to Houston because I thought it was going to be this huge upset thing uh, that would happen. But uh, when I look at this game and I see uh, what both teams have done, uh, regardless of how impressed I've been with LAFC and their ability to mold uh, and and attack and approach games in different ways, um, I just got to go with the offensive power and the consistency of Columbus. I think they've had a really tough road to get here. Playing at Cincinnati is difficult. Playing against uh, Atlanta in, in that series was really, really hard. Uh, you have a lot of those concepts that you're going to have to have ready against LAFC, against both of those teams, because you did have an Atlanta team that pushed you, challenged you, uh, was able to stretch your defense and you were able to kind of get back into those games and make some adjustments if you're uh, Will for Dancy. Uh, you have a really deep bench because of your health. So you know exactly what you're getting. And you got game changers off of your bench. You got guys that could come in and lock down a, a squad. Darley Tegnagby in that midfield for me has more experience than any of the midfielders for LAFC. Uh, and I think that's going to be a big, big deal. You know, he's a winner. He's been there, done that. Um, I think Aiden Morris came off really upset when he got switched out uh, for Gressel in that uh, last game. I think he's going to come in with a little chip on his shoulder to just be even better than he has been. Uh, so with all that, and despite LAFC and their fantastic, um, you know, run, I think that Columbus, at Columbus, where they've been, really, really good all season long. Uh, they're going to take this one. Uh, I'm going to go with a not, I don't, I wouldn't call it high scoring, but I think it's going to be a multiple goal game. Uh, but I have Columbus winning at least, at least put in three on the board. So three, one, three, two, I think Columbus wins it. Wow. Okay. So Jarrett right now, the, uh, the Christmas side dishes have yeah. plus plus one seventeen. 
90 okay. minute draw is a plus 245, and LAFC is a plus 227. They've been pretty much in that margin of error. They haven't moved a whole lot. Those are your numbers. Uh, here's the thing, though, man. I'm I'm right there with Nico, and I three two sounds right, okay. and I could see Columbus doing what they did to Cincinnati in an extent, not to the same, not not like the exact same script, but if you told me that LAFC got a lead in this game, and then they let the mask slip for just a minute, we've seen how Columbus can play. Columbus can just start putting they won't they don't just hit you. They hit you with combos. And they hit you with combos over a 6-7 minute span where in a similar way funny enough to what like the 2019-2020 LAFC teams did to people where they would just the game would be flowing and then all of a sudden it'd be pop 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 mm. 3 and 10 minutes where yep. it was just a just, just an avalanche. If you told me it was like one nothing LAFC and then Columbus just smacked them three times in 15 minutes to make it 3-1 and then you got one late to make it 3-2, I would buy that script for, for a dollar. Okay, so right now our, our, our Christmas side dishes have four and a half at a plus 500, Nico. Ooh! Four and a half. That a half is where that where it breaks. Yeah, uh, that's that's that is that is the Rubicon. We three and a half. The, the half was it three and a half? Plus two twenty five in the composite. That's still okay. That's safe for money. Uh, but the four and a half is tempting, though. I'm not gonna lie to you. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, that's a, that's a lot of goals. I I do have a like I said, I, I have a, a gut feeling, and you know, I'm none of this fantastic analyst like you see on MLS, but I have a feeling that. LAFC is going to come into this game playing a lot more open and it's going to, I don't want to say they're going to, they're going to go shot for shot against Columbus, but they're going to try to force them to defend. And because Columbus does have a little bit of holes in that uh, three man back line and they had some issues with some set pieces, I think that this game is going to have multiple goals. So I don't know, man, uh, I'll, I'll stick with the three and a half. I really will. But that, that four and a half is tempting. All right, so you should, yeah, because the like last year's game was three three before it went to extra time. The last game before that to have five goals in it was two thousand and four. Yeah. Was right. the Kansas City Wiz yeah. and yeah, no, that's tough. Yeah, no, three and a half save money. I go with that. Three and a half. All right, so Seattle made their roster decisions, and Stephen Fry was probably one of the fastest decisions where, yes, we are having ongoing discussions and then we re-sign him. When you look at the roster decisions that are in play now for Seattle, what's ran, what ran through your mind when they announced? I thought that they were pretty um, standard and expected. Uh, I thought that Stefan Fry should have been a no-brainer, especially knowing that uh, Nicolas Odero was for sure leaving. You need to have leaders in this team. He's the captain of this squad. Nicolas Odero, when he decided to give back that captain band, uh, he could think of no one better than Stefan Fry to take that honor. Uh, he's been reliable. He's coming from a fantastic season um, with, you know, 14 shutouts. And, you know, as always, uh, beyond his ability to stop goals is the leadership aspect, the way he holds his players accountable. Um I just thought it was a no-brainer. So I was happy that he got a two-year deal. He's probably going to retire here in Seattle. Uh, that means that, uh, and you saw it with the roster moves, that obviously uh, Cleveland, who's, a, I think, a really good goalkeeper, he's probably going to go elsewhere, a lot like Tyler Miller did at some point for the Seattle Sounders. Uh, there's some really good and potential in behind the behind Stephen Fry that you might not know about. Jacob Castro, he's a guy that they've been kind of working with, who I like a lot. Um, he seems to be a really good shot stopper. So I think they're really going to build off of those other guys behind Stephen Fry. Uh, so it was good to have a guy like that give you some continuity and some leadership. I was um, surprised with only the fact that Dylan Tevis was picked up his option and then Doubler wasn't. Uh, the doubler was a guy that had a lot of potential. He's, you know, had um, 
some rough road with injuries, but I, I thought he was really, really good. Uh, that was probably my only surprise. Javier Arraga getting his contract picked up. You heard me say it here. That's going to be a obviously easy decision. That doesn't mean he's going to stay. I think that they got, they will trade him. Uh, there is interest within MLS. Um, and that's about it. I think everybody else, you kind of already knew what was going to happen. Albert Rusnak, a lot of people here in Seattle have mixed feelings about it. The main point of them saying, hey, is Albert really worth the DP spot? And, and I'm going to say, yeah, look, Albert gives you a lot of versatility. He hasn't been fantastic and extraordinary. And I know that when people think DP, they think Dennis Wonga and Tiago Amada and uh, Mokhtar and all of these players that are just in a different type of level. But a DP spot can also be a guy that's going to give you a high floor. And, and I think that's what he does. I'm not sure if Seattle's going to retain this 4-2-3-1 next season. There are, I think, a lot of possibilities that the, that system changes. And having a guy like Albert that can just play more uh, as an 8 and more of a CM than a Cam um, is good. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard, but uh, Pedro de la Vega is uh, a guy that Seattle is getting close to signing. Is a guy oh, that wait a second. I thought that the number 10s at Lanus were always supposed to come to Atlanta, man. <laughs> what is that? I guess so. I guess not. But but this guy, he's he's not just a 10, right? He's He play out wide. Uh, I've actually been doing a lot of research on, on, on the kid, and I talked to a video analyst um, from Lanus, and he told me that th th there's been times where he – he comes a little bit deeper and, and can play still out wide. You know, he was thinking in, in a 4-3-3 type of situation where he'd be a, a right mid, where he has more time to run on through the ball because he does have very good vision. He does carry it very well. Um, so I think because of having a guy like that, a young DP, uh, having a guy like Albert could give you a lot of options on the system that you're going to run. Um, so that's interesting enough. And that's why I think it's a good decision to keep a guy like Albert for that DP spot. But let's talk about the new kid, uh, 22 years old. I got scooped. I had been teasing it here. I teased it uh, on Sounders Weekly. He was a, a young midfielder they've had in line for a long time. He's still a Lanus only because he had a knee injury, a ligament tear, uh, 2022. Otherwise, he would have been gone, according to everybody who I've talked to, uh, whether it was in Europe or, or whether it was in Mexico. There was a lot of interest in this kid. Has a lot of potential. It's a high ceiling. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's going to come in and dominate right away. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's going to be the Nicolas Odero of this era, because I couldn't, right? Nicolas Odero was a guy that was proven, that you knew he was going to come in exactly what he was going to give you. Uh, Pedro de la Vega is going to be a guy that you're hoping that he could be everything that everyone sees from him. Uh, he's played in Argentina national team. He's played in the U23 with guys like Julian Alvarez and I believe Tiago Amara um, at some point. So this is a kid that I think has a lot of talent. And uh, Seattle is being ambitious with this sort of signing. He's by far the best prospect offensively that they've had. Uh, signing from out broad. So it's, it's interesting. And he goes along the lines of all the decisions that have happened here in Seattle. All right. So what's going on? Soccer bar and Pulso sports, my friend. All right. Soccer bar is going to be here in about 40 minutes. Uh, we're going to talk MLS. We're going to hear from Chirundalo. Uh LAFC is already at um, the scene of the events in Columbus. Uh, so we, we got some uh, word from, a few protagonists down there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these news, some of these transactions. So go ahead and check it out. And in Puzo Sports, uh, we're going to have an end of the season kind of round table here next week. So check that out. Um, it's going to be interesting. We're going to, of course, uh, cover as much as we can uh, of the uh, MLS finals. And that's what you got. All right. As always, it's great to have Nico here on Thursday. Uh, next Thursday, uh, we won't be live. Uh, Jason might be reaching out to you because I am in transit to Washington, D.C., so we're going to be covering things like a morning update and an afternoon update, so just keep your antennas up for a morning update or an afternoon update since we're in that window. So I will be on a plane 
So we're doing things differently next week with morning updates and afternoon updates. Be safe, my friend. I will see you in a couple of weeks, and we will talk about all the things, Copa America, MLS Cup, all that, but you'll get to talk to Jason first. Thanks for hanging out with us again on a Thursday, my friend. All righty, man. Appreciate you guys. All right. That is Nico Moreno. He's got to get ready for another show. So his, his Thursdays are busy, man. It's like he comes on here. He gets up. He's on his second cup of coffee. He's doing his stuff, and he's ready to go. Morning, Harry. Great to have you uh, hanging out with us from Texas. We'll wrap up with uh, what's going on, what to watch, where to watch it, and how to watch. So uh, here we go with uh, what to watch and where to watch it. Busy day. Tottenham and West Ham at 315. We'll get into juice boxes in a sec. That's on USA. Uh, Pumas and Tigres, semifinals, 930 on 2 to NA. ESPN Plus has the Belgian Cup, the Air Divisie. Double header at 12.40 and 3 o'clock. Four matchups in the Copa del Rey. One at 1, three at 3 o'clock. On NCAA.com, it is the Division II semifinals. Franklin Pierce and Lewis at 5. Florida Tech, the Panthers, making their way in from the Sun Conference, taking on CSU Pueblo at 8. On the women's side, it is the choice. Wow, they're chasing a double at Florida Tech. We'll have to follow along with that. Uh, the Panthers at Florida Tech taking on point Loma. That is now underway, and that is early first half. And Adelphi and Washburn out of Kansas is at 2 o'clock. So same venue, 11-2 are your women's semifinals. 5-8 and eight are your men's semis in Division Two. Peacock has Everton and Newcastle at 2.30. So let's get you into juice boxes really quickly so we can all get out of here. And a reminder, once again, tomorrow it is prem and proper in the morning. SDH will be live in the afternoon. I don't know when yet. Probably middle of the afternoon, so that way we can get, get everything squared away from what happened in Europe, get you previewed, and get everything rock uh, rocking and rolling for uh, what's going on for your weekend. So once again, prem and proper, out tomorrow morning, and then live SDH PM in the afternoon sometime because I have to be at Mercedes-Benz Stadium to get ready for uh, the high school football championships. Juice boxes for uh, Everton and Newcastle. Newcastle is a road favorite, even with all the injuries, at a plus 139. Draws at a plus 250. Everton is north of plus 200 at a 204 in the composite. Spurs a minus 133 with visiting West Ham. 90-minute draws a plus 328. And West Ham is a plus 345. Wow. Abby is really cooking tomorrow. She says, uh, look at this. Cooking all day. 10 pounds. Of, is it 10 pounds or 10 plates of, of potato latkes? See, now that, you know, man. Oh, uh, man. That's, now, I'm, now I'm hunkering for Polish food, too. 10 pounds. Thank you. 10 pounds of potato latkes. Uh, so Abby's going to be cooking all day. How do you know when it's 10 pounds? Just curious. Anyway, potato latkes uh, cooking uh, tomorrow for Abby. So once again, prem and proper on tape. In the morning, SDH PM to get you through the afternoon and get you moving toward the weekend. So that's where we are. So once again, thanks as always. Oh, you buy 10 pounds of potatoes. There you go. That makes sense. Uh, thanks to all of you guys for hanging out with us this morning. We had a lot of news we had to get through. And uh, we had Nico on at 1030. It was great to have Jared on as well to uh, break through everything and uh, tell Joey Barton he's an idiot. And Luis Rubiales, you're an idiot too, allegedly. But yeah, jo Joey Barton is an idiot. So when you have idiots saying things on in public fora, they need to be called out. And as much as you don't want to give them the time of day, you kind of need to to remind us that we have to be vigilant in those kinds of situations. So we got folks who do fantastic work in this business, and we have to continually remind everyone that Stupid people, yes, stupid people are allowed to have forums too, but they still need to be, be called out for being stupid. So that was uh, the Joey Barton excursion that we had this morning in hour number one. You can go back and listen. Thanks to everybody who was watching on the YouTube, on the Twitch, and on the 280 character app. Obviously, the audio version will be out in short order. You can listen to this, and we'll pull all the segments, and we'll be back at it again on tape to start things off tomorrow. SDHPM on the live side of things. So since it is the end of the show, Mucha plot y'all. Play it safe, everybody. We'll catch up with you in various forms tomorrow. That means I get to do this, and we'll be back at it again tomorrow. Have a thankful Thursday. I agree, Abby. We'll see you later.